Last year, I had the chance to live in Geneva. It's a city commonly mistaken as the capital of Switzerland. Of course, we all know that's not the case because Bern is the, is the capital of Switzerland. This slick and cosmopolitan city is home to a riot of outspoken people speaking almost every language in the world, Visaya included. In fact, where I went to school in, in Geneva, I met everyone from Albania all the way to Zimbabwe, and I found that very fascinating. Geneva is a global city. It is a microcosm of the earth, and everywhere you go, you find a representative of every country in the world. Despite its size, would you believe that Geneva is only half as big as Dumaguete City? The second largest city in Switzerland. Yes, it is the second largest city in Switzerland. Packs quite a punch in global affairs. It is home to more than 200 international organizations and non-governmental organizations, such as the World Trade Organization, the second largest branch of the World Bank, the European headquarters of the United Nations, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and other international organizations. More often than not, the future of the world is discussed and decided in this tiny Swiss city. Now, I would like to believe that Geneva has the capacity to forge international partnerships with other cities around the world, thus bypassing the usual route often taken by the kind of diplomacy we are all very much familiar with. Another city I'd like to share with you is that it's a very popular city, and I had a chance to experience the city last year. We have New York. So New York never leaves people's bucket lists, and for a very good reason. Broadway, the chance to make the world listen to you, dream jobs, these are only a few of the many reasons why New York is often touted as the concrete jungle where dreams are made of. So they weren't kidding when they said that if you make it in New York, you're bound to make it anywhere around the world. New York City is a trendsetter in many respects. In fact, when the United States opted out from the Paris Accords, an international agreement bent on fighting climate change, it was New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg who boldly stepped up and led other city mayors in the United States to declare that with or without the support of national government, New York City and other cities in the United States are still taking climate action to an entirely different level. This movement has spread like a wildfire all over the world. Today, cities are realizing just how much power and potential they hold in their hands to make a difference. And this is just the beginning. It is predicted that in the coming decades, civicism, the pride and loyalty to one city, will take precedence over nationalism. What does this mean? This means, for example, that there will be a growing consciousness among people like you and me to identify ourselves as Dumagetanios first, Filipinos second. But where do cities draw so much power, confidence, and influence from? Three things. First, people. More than half of humanity currently lives in cities for work, education, and of course for opportunities. In fact, it is predicted that by 2050, close to one-third of the entire Earth will live in urban areas. As more people move to cities, cities will experience a tremendous amount of brain gain. The more people cities attract, the more expertise and talent they will have at its own disposal. This deep pool of creativity fuels a city's economic activity. As economic activity ramps up, 
cities become stronger magnets, attracting talent, knowledge, and expertise. Regardless of whether you look at it from the local or global perspective, one thing is for sure. People are a country's greatest reserves of power. Second, innovation. Now, because cities attract a diversity of people, it naturally becomes a birthplace of ideas that change the world. Austrian economist Josef Schumpeter calls it the gales of creative destruction, and these gales, they blow first in cities, rendering politics, science, technology, culture, and the arts totally unrecognizable in a matter of years. The Silicon Valley megacity cluster, for example, in California, gave birth to Google, Facebook, Twitter, which has changed the way we connect with each other, as well as the way we consume information. So I remember back then, in order for us to get our daily serving of news and current events, we would either buy a newspaper or scramble in front of the television. Today, thanks to social media and of course our smartphones, we don't need to do that. We can easily find out what our neighbor is having for dinner or what agreement a world leader is signing next as these events unfold. Third, wealth. Cities drive the world economy. 600 of the world's most prosperous cities power more than half of the global economy. Some cities even have a larger economic output than entire countries, and let me give you a few examples of that. We have Paris, for example, it has a larger GDP than South Africa. Beijing contributes more to the world economy than, say, Sweden. Seoul churns out a higher GDP than Malaysia. And you know what it's like in international affairs. The bigger your economic muscles are, the louder your voice is on the global negotiation table. Yet despite how powerful and influential cities have become, cities are hitting a glass ceiling. And this is because international relations is still largely international, between and among states with the national government still calling the shots. Cities are still generally disconnected from ministries of foreign affairs. And this limits the ability of cities to unleash their potential in helping a country successfully meet its time-bound global commitments. So in order for cities to go full speed in international affairs, perhaps it's high time for cities to beef up their ability to conduct diplomacy and to craft their own foreign policy. Now, I'd like to make this clear. I am not advocating for cities to totally replace ministries of foreign affairs as the chief architects of a nation's foreign policy. It's far from it. What I am suggesting is a synergy. Cities can create an office of international affairs within City Hall, while the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Department of Foreign Affairs, as some countries have it, can at the same time create an office that will play a collaborating role in unleashing the power of city diplomacy. Developing strategies that will empower cities and at the same time strengthen the relationship between country level and city level diplomacy will ultimately prove to be a more resilient foreign affairs model in the coming years. So here's what I have in mind in order to make this work out. Ministries of Foreign Affairs can create an Office of City Diplomacy to work closely with cities and to enhance coordination between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and local governments in managing trade and investment ties, sister city linkages, and other urban initiatives linked towards fulfilling international commitments, such as the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Sendai Framework, Habitat 3, and the Paris Accords. The Office of City Diplomacy must meet regularly with the different representatives from City Hall's Foreign Affairs Office, as well as representatives from other relevant offices within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, such as the Office of Public Diplomacy, 
to make sure that everyone, and I mean everyone, is on the same page. Why is, why is this important? It's because a robust and coherent communication strategy is critical when cities want to engage with international partners and at the same time when the country, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, wants to promote the urban agenda in international fora such as the United Nations. The Ministry can also play a recommendatory role by recommending to city diplomats the possible areas where our city, for example, Dum Dumaguete City, can collaborate with and make things happen with other cities such as New York. Ministries of Foreign Affairs will gain from a closer relationship with city governments in the sense that country-level diplomacy will have a better perspective of the local dimension of international issues. For example, how do agreements in, say, health, agriculture, education make sense to cities like Cebu, Tacloban, Dumaguete, Davao? These are important perspectives that are often missed out because country-level diplomacy almost often takes a broad and sweeping view. For foreign policy to be felt by the people, it must be brought closer to the people. The establishment of a specialized office to empower cities in global affairs is only one side of the coin. The success of this endeavor also rests heavily on the creation of the Office of Foreign Affairs within City Hall. Yet before cities can create an Office of Foreign Affairs, cities need to think about how it can harness the academe, its diverse population, the media, businesses, everything that shapes its entire identity in such a way that it will be able to tell a compelling story bridging this city to the rest of the international community. This point to ponder can prove to be an important springboard when cities want to create ties with the rest of the world. So today, I want to start by letting you ask two questions. Number one, what story do I want my city to tell the rest of the world? And second, why should the rest of the world listen to my city? This effort requires the city to develop a strong framework to support its global vision. City Hall's Office of Foreign Affairs must work closely with the mayor in coordinating with the Foreign Ministry's Office of City Diplomacy and in strengthening the city's international ties. Once concrete ways of working have been developed, cities will need to formally establish their presence overseas. Cities can achieve this by deploying city diplomats in other cities where it has key strategic interests. This also means that the city mayor and other officials must travel overseas regularly to meet with their counterparts to discuss how they can make things happen for both of their cities. This is an initiative that cities like Toronto, for example, have already done today. City Hall's Office of Foreign Affairs will play a critical role, not only in attracting investments, talent, and travelers, but more importantly, in helping local constituents better understand how international issues and their country's foreign policy make sense in their daily lives. Cities can help ministries of foreign affairs understand why citizens like you and me feel a certain way about certain global affairs issues. This will help ministries in creating and recalibrating strategic and tactical plans to advance nas national interest, which is truly representative of what we need as a people. Working closely with city governments will help the national government localize international development targets by crafting action plans from the bottom up. This ensures that plans are more responsive and that they truly represent what everyone needs. Instead of fighting over the same piece of pie, cities and national governments can take on diplomatic activities that complement each other, thereby amplifying each other's efforts. Both the city and the national government will stand to gain from this arrangement. Cities represent something that is closer to the everyday lives of citizens, where the national government can help give cities a boost by linking the local
to the global. Cities can therefore significantly help the national government achieve the city's global commitments, especially on a range of issues such as peace and security, equality, economic growth. Conversely, cities stand to gain by having a clear and formal structure integrating the national government's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to the city or to the local government. And through the strength of these connections, it can fully equip both city and national government as we hurtle into the future. Cities can lead in developing local solutions and forging partnerships aimed at achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which require urban solutions. Cities can also help in promoting art, culture, and even tourism internationally. Because whether we like it or not, each city has a distinct personality that must be marketed and it must be told to the rest of the world, which is independent from the rest of the country. The greatest challenge lies in garnering enough political support from its citizens and changing the mindset of city leaders on the global nature of cities today. The success of city diplomacy rests on convincing citizens that each of us has a role to play in global affairs. September 2015 marked an important milestone in the global development agenda. The year marked the beginning of our collective journey towards achieving the most aspirational goals to date. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development spanning 17 sustainable development goals and 169 underpinning targets. These address the greatest challenges of our time. The SDGs are intertwined and indivisible. This means only one thing, that everyone is required to join in, that all hands need to be on deck. Of these cities and many other key areas that they cover, innovation, economic growth, equality, urbanization, climate change, these are among the global goals. This makes cities crucial not only as focal points in the sustainable development agenda, but as key sectors in helping us achieve the future that we want. However, in order for us to achieve this, on the dot, our cities need to make their voices heard on the global negotiation table. We all live in times that are considered the new normal. What we need is a radical shift from the business-as-usual approach in order for us to overcome our existential challenges. Empowering cities as major players in global affairs and developing a concrete framework to strengthen the ties binding country-level and city diplomacy represents this radical yet necessary shift. As cities gain more power and influence, in the coming years, cities will cease to be mere spectators in global affairs. Rather, cities, Dumaguete City included, cities are poised to become important players and the country's most important partner in enabling all of us to achieve the future we have always dreamed of. Thank you.